Well, that was good. Okay, please open your Bibles uh, to Genesis chapter 17. We are making our way through a study in the book of Genesis, taking a chapter at a time, and we're now in chapter 17. And I'll just tell you what's going to happen here. Uh, we'll just go through this a little bit, verse at a time. But what's going to happen is uh, God is going to institute the, uh, the sign of the covenant, which uh, the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Anybody know what that is? What is the sign of the covenant? Embarrassing to say out loud, isn't it? <laughs> Circumcision. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> I know, right? They didn't even have anesthesia in those days, so it's, like, it's already an uncomfortable adult conversation. Uh, it's okay, so it's the sign. The covenant becomes personalized, okay? The covenant actually had already been made, right? Back in chapter 15, God told Abraham, I'm going to make my covenant with you. And uh, he did that strange ceremony where animals were killed and cut in half, and then laid down in a row, and, and typically what they do is the two people that were party to the covenant would walk between the dead animals, and it would signify that this covenant is sealed by blood, and if one of us fails, you're going to get what happened to them. And so that was the whole setup. God, Abraham laid the dead animals on the ground, and then God said, you don't need to walk through. I'm going through alone. And he went through in the sign of a burning oven and a flaming torch. And so it was God went through alone indicating, I'm sealing this covenant in blood and I'm taking responsibility for your failure. It's a sign of the new covenant, although it's not. It was sort of indicating that. So that's already happened. That was chapter 15. Now, God had promised to Abraham an amazing thing, that he would have a biological son through his wife, Sarah. They're very old people. She's actually gone through menopause, and she's beyond the time of childbearing. But nevertheless, God said to Abraham, that, or Abram, his name is Abram at this point, that this was going to happen, and that from him would come uh, a whole a nation and that from his family, the whole world would be blessed, which is actually the gospel, because we know that from Abram came Jesus, right? That's how Matthew opens up his gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the genealogy, the son of David, the son of Abraham, right? So now, and here in chapter 17 the covenant gets applied personally. It's already been made, but now Abraham is going to receive the sign of the covenant, which is circumcision. It's going to be signed and sealed. So chapter 17, verse 1, says, When Abram was 99 years old. Now that's kind of interesting because the last verse of the previous chapter said Abram was 86 years old. So it's been 13 years since he's heard anything from God. I have a question. What did he do for 13 years? You know what he did? He did the same thing that you and I do. He got up every morning, made himself a little something to eat, probably spent a little time in prayer with his wife, Sarah, and then he went to work. Because he had 318 men on his payroll. He had a very big, thriving business. A lot of cattle. A lot of people. And he'd work, and then he'd come home. He'd hang out with his wife. And they'd talk and pray, take a walk, go to bed, and do it again. For six days in a row. And then they'd take a day off. They'd observe Sabbath. Sabbath. He walked by faith. You know, it's not often said, but it's worth saying that the Christian life oftentimes, most of the time, 
is pretty routine. It really is. You just kind of do the same thing every day, and you don't always get goosebumps, and your hair doesn't stand up on your arms because the power of God is moving. Well, He is. It's just so natural. And every day, we're walking with God. And that's what He did. It's actually been 24 years since God first spoke to him and told him that there was going to be this child born and that he would have, be a blessing to many nations. So he's waited for a long time for an unfulfilled promise. We're coming right off the, the heels of chapter 16. Well, it's been 13 years, but in chapter 16... Abraham tried to get God's promise accomplished in his own effort. So he and Sarah, very, you know, good plan in that, look, why don't you have an affair with my servant girl, Hagar, and if she gets pregnant, we'll have you know, a half-son. It won't be my son, but it'll be your son. And that's how we'll get God's promise fulfilled. They tried to do it in their own strength, with their own scheming and their own ingenuity and their own effort. And you can never do that. You can't accomplish God's purposes and see his will fulfilled in your life in your own effort. It's not by might or strength. It's by my power, said the Lord. Zechariah 4, verse 6. So when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. All right, pop quiz, church. What's God Almighty mean? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) El Shaddai, right? El, God, El, God, Almighty, Shaddai, right? Means Almighty means almighty, omnipotent. God is coming to Abram, and he's saying, I am all-powerful, limitless power. Isn't that amazing? Here's God Almighty having a normal conversation with a human. And Abram's not freaking out. He worships. He goes down on his face. God Almighty, all-powerful, unlimited, able to do anything, absolute sovereign, supreme ruler, king of kings, lord of lords, God Almighty, there's nothing too hard for him. There's nothing impossible with God Almighty. Been a long time since Abram had had a conversation with God. And so at this point in his life, after waiting for 24 years, and after living for 13 years from his failure of the faith, going through his own efforts to try to get God's promise accomplished in his own efforts with Hagar, right? Ishmael was born. Ishmael's 13. Ishmael had been weaned. He took solid food. He learned language. He grew up. He's a teenager, (laughs) probably has a pimple, uh, very self-conscious, and, you know, he's Ishmael. God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Live with me, Abram, uh, faithfully. It's kind of what he says there. And then he says, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. I just want to draw to your attention as we go through this, that you're going to see ten times God is going to say, I will. And nine times he's going to say, my covenant. I will. I will. I will. And I'm going to make my covenant with you. So I just want to emphasize that because I tell you, What I'm getting from this, or what I want to try to present God to us this morning, 
is he sounds to me like a bridegroom stating his intentions to his bride. I will. I am dedicated to you in this way. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Verse 3, then Abram fell on his face. And I'm just going to pause there for a moment because that is so manly of God. And I say that in the sense that he's actually bringing up the elephant in the room. He's talking about the one thing that he and Sarah have been holding on to, this one word from God that you've promised me, something that I, I, it's now impossible to come to pass. I'm 99. Sarah's 90. We're going to see that later on. She's beyond. It's, God waited until it was actually humanly impossible. And that's why he came to him and said, all things are possible, my friend. I'm here now on the scene. And that which I have promised to you, which you've waited for, not always faithfully, it's now about to come to pass. He's touched on the one thing that actually had become maybe a bit painful to talk about. It's the one sort of awkward personal situation that he and Sarah and, and God's talking with him right up front about it. Let's get this on the table, Abram. I don't want you to live in secrecy. And to, I don't want you to live in, in, in darkness about this. I'm light. Abram fell on his face. He just, that must have hurt. Anyway, <laughs> it's like, ow. <laughs> It's just like, you know, doesn't it tell us that in Philippians? <laughs> when Jesus comes, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And here he is, God Almighty. Interesting, how did God appear to him? I don't know, but he did. In some real, visible, communicative way, and evidently in some almost human-like form, it would seem, And then God says in verse 4, and verses 4 through 8, he kind of talks about the covenant. As for me, behold, now verse 4, I just want to point out, that's New King James, and in most of the translations, that's how that verse begins, as for me. I know in uh, ESV it doesn't say that. Uh, that's, that's fine, but I just want to point that out. As for me... And the reason I'm pointing that out, because in verse 9, God said to Abram, as for you, <laughs> okay, here's your side of the deal, okay? All I want you to do is just believe by faith and apply the covenant to your life, the sign of the covenant, all right? So as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations, no longer shall your name be called Abram, which means exalted father, but your name shall be Abraham, which means father of a multitude. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Starting with David, of course, King David. And then ultimately comes King Jesus, right? I'm going to make kings from you. Verse 7, and I will establish my covenant, for the third time he says, my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant. And here really, actually, the whole point of the covenant is what he's going to say next. The whole point of the covenant is that I want to be God to you and your descendants after you. That's, that's almighty God who loves people. That is God telling Abraham something that is, doesn't even exist yet. That is the Alpha speaking about the end, the Omega. That is God who is calling something that exists, even though it doesn't actually exist, which is the nation Israel, people who were 
biologically and genetically offspring of Abraham, Hebrews, Jewish people. But it goes beyond that because of Jesus. And we know that he's actually talking further than that to us, the church. That's why I like to think about God El Shaddai, Almighty, because he's my God. Almighty God. He can call things into being that don't even exist yet because he knows he's going to accomplish them in your life, even though you've been waiting years or it feels like years. When we first moved here, the Lord gave two verses of Scripture to me about planting a church here in Ithaca in 2000. We moved here in 2000. And one of the verses was from Haggai 1, verse 8, which said, Go up to the mountain, bring wood, build my house, and I will take pleasure in it. I waited 14 years for that to come to pass. We didn't meet in this building. We rented space at a local hotel. And yet the Lord had given that verse, and it got to the point where it's like, I don't know if I believe it anymore. And yet it was so clear. The, page, the words jumped off the page in the context of me praying, Lord, how can we establish ourselves in a more permanent, visible location? And just in some devotional reading, that Haggai 1.8 came off, and he said, and, and his spirit just said, there's your verse, God, I'm going to accomplish that. And the dust grew on that little promise that sat on the shelf. And one day I got a call from a guy who was pastoring a church, small church right here in this building. And he called me up. I barely knew him, Guy Kinney. He said, hey, we need people. You need a building. Why don't we talk about joining together? And I'm like, okay. We had coffee, and he sort of talked more. And then I went home, and all of a sudden, the dust blew off that old promise. I'm like, here it is. God, you're so good. God is so good. The whole point is, my brothers and sisters, do you see God's heart? I want you to see God's heart in this. God Almighty is a God of powerful love in that he wants to be the God of all people. I'm starting with you, Abram. You and Sarah, I'm going to bless you immensely. You're never actually going to see it. You're going to see Isaac and you're going to die. You're going to have one son. And then your son is going to have twins. And he's going to die. And out of those twins, only one will be the one who inherits this promise. And then Jacob. He'll have 12. And then years will go by before they become a nation. But God could call it into existence, that which he knew would come to pass. And the whole point is to be God to you and your descendants after you. Verse 8, also, I prefer that word right there. He says, and, or also, I will give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. All right? So it's people in God's people in God's place. Abraham, I'm choosing you. I'm going to do a work with you. I'm going to make a people group out of you. And I'm, I want to establish you, the Jewish people, here in this land as an everlasting possession. My brothers and sisters, it couldn't be more timely based on what's going on in Israel right now. That verse right there ought to help us in our foreign policy, ought to help all people who read the Bible in understanding a good foreign policy in relationship to the, the problems in Israel today. Okay? It's the land he gave them as an everlasting possession, which had been vacated for about 2,000 years until 48 when Israel came back and established themselves as an independent land again, independent nation back in the promised land. Verse 9, God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. As for you, your side of the deal here, as we go through this, is that you will keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout your generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant 
between me and you. So don't get confused, brothers and sisters. The covenant is not the circumcision. That's a sign of the circumcision. Many of the covenants in the Old Testament come with a sign. God made a covenant with Noah. What was the sign? Rainbow, right? God made a covenant with Moses up on Mount Sinai. What was the sign of the Mosaic covenant? The Sabbath. That was a sign of the covenant, right? Here he's making a sign of the covenant, and the sign is circumcision. Why circumcision? That's weird. Well, actually, it's not so unnatural, or uh, it was actually something that was practiced in that day and age. I think that based on what happened in chapter 16, where Abram and Sarah devised a little plan that he would have sex with Hagar, I think he's just sort of sending his message. You live by faith in the promise, and you live a pure life. Because my king is going to come from through your line, Abram. So I'll tell you, what I see in this, it, to me, it's, it's almost like a, in, in our New Testament thinking, this Abram receiving the sign and actually applying it to himself, he does circumcise himself and all those in his household. To me, it's, it's a sign of, sanctification. I am agreeing that I, you have called me to yourself. You've set me apart. I'm your son. I'm your daughter. And now I am going to separate and set myself apart in the way that I live. I'm going to live a godly life by the power of your spirit. Doesn't Paul teach us that? This is the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. This is, what's the will of God? Your sanctification. That's what Paul said. That you would not commit sexual immorality. That's what he said in that verse. There's an amazing correlation to what's happening right here based on what had happened in Abram's life. He's like, we're done with that, Abe. Okay, don't, don't go sleeping around anymore. I want you to stay faithful, and I want you, because I'm going to bless you. Yeah, but Lord, I'm 99. They don't have drugs to change my behaviors and all these weird things today. <laughs> what did God do? God supernaturally empowered Abraham and Sarah. I don't know. He gave her an egg. <laughs> he gave him ability. He basically revived this old couple. Verse 12, God goes on. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male child in your generations. He was born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He was born in your house, he was bought with your money, must be circumcised. My covenant, six time, shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. I want you to cut away the flesh. It was your flesh that got you in trouble. I want you to cut away your flesh. Verse 14, and the uncircumcised male child who's not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He's broken my covenant. Okay? Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Uh, Sarah means princess. That makes sense. If we got a king who's going to come from this family line, then the king's got to come from a princess. And he said, I will bless her and also give you a son by her, and I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Then Abram fell, <laughs> he fell on his face. Apparently, during this conversation with God, he got back up off his face the first time. <laughs> He's like, well, this is really interesting. <laughs> And now you're telling me some really weird stuff. But now you're telling me that, Sarah, that we're going to enjoy intimacy again. And it seems inconceivable to me. Anybody get that or no? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Abram fell on his face and laughed. 
and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old, and shall Sarah, who is 99 years, or 90 years old, bear a child? He's not unbelieving. It sounds like that. And that's how I've understood it for so long. But Romans chapter 4 tells us that Abraham was not weakened in his faith when he was about 100 years old. So that's, Rome, that's a New Testament commentary on this little moment of merriment that Abram's having. I guess I can say Abraham now. Right? He's not unbelieving. To me, I tell you what, to me he sounds very much like Mary. When Gabriel came to Mary and he said, hey, <laughs> we're going to have our hand, we're going to have on our hands here a pregnant virgin. <laughs> you know what? She believed. She didn't understand, but she believed. And actually, Gabriel said to her, there's nothing impossible with God. And, he, and Mary's famous reply, behold, the servant of the Lord, be it unto me according to your will. I think Abe's right in that same place. He's like, I believe. I don't understand. My faith is taking me only up to a point here where it's, it's like, yeah, I, you're God Almighty, but it seems unbelievable to me. <laughs> I believe you, and I believe your word, but it seems crazy to me to think that you could go beyond my expectations. He's laughing, actually, with joy. Given that understanding, I think he's just laughing with joy. He's like, oh my goodness. Now, by the way, like, where's Sarah? I don't know where she's at. It sounds like a private conversation here, right? And can you, can you imagine Abraham coming away from this little camp meeting, and he goes back into his home, and he goes back to all of his employees, and he's like, Puts a name tag on. Don't call me Abram anymore. I'm Abraham. <laughs> and they all laughed. They all laughed at him. Well, they knew what it meant. It meant father of many nations. It was like, you're not even a father. <laughs> and you're an old man. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Can you imagine Sarah showing up at the emergency room? <laughs> right? Nine months later, she gets out. Oh, are you here for geriatrics? No, I'm here for obstetrics. <laughs> you know, with her cane. They, I mean, Abraham had, and he's like, Sarah, hon, your name's Sarah. You're a princess. God's, this is what's going to happen. Verse 18, Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. He loves Ishmael. Ishmael is his son. He loves him. I think Sarah and Ishmael had a hard time getting along. Sarah and Hagar had a hard time getting along most of their life, if not all their life. But Ishmael was Abram's son, and he dearly loved that young man. And I think at this point, he's just like, oh, Lord, can you bless Ishmael? I don't want to, be, I don't want to overlook this young guy. And God said, no, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. we got a lot of name stuff going on in this chapter, don't we? God introduces himself with a new name. It's the first time, Almighty, El Shaddai. And now it's Abraham, and it's Sarah. And by the way, you're going to have a boy, and I want you to call him Isaac. And I want you to circumcise him on the eighth day. You know, that's why when Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph took him to the uh, on the eighth day to get circumcised and they named him Jesus. It became Jewish custom that on the eighth day, the time of circumcision, that's when you would name your son. And that's exactly what we see happening in Luke chapter 2 after Jesus was born. So name him Isaac, which means laughter. His name means laughter. By the way, it's the first time the word laugh or laughter is used in the Bible. 
We used to joke around years ago. Uh, I, well, we still do, but it's like, it's like, is it okay to laugh in church? God, I hope so. <laughs> Please. <laughs> what is laughter? Any of you scientists know? <laughs> like, what happens inside of a human that causes somebody to just laugh? It actually has healing properties, so I'm told. I was listening to somebody talk about this verse, and they said, and I don't know, maybe you guys know, but they would take, some people would, to help cancer patients, they would put them in a room and they would show the three stooges and just get the cancer patients to laugh, and they actually saw tangible improvements in their physical health from just expressing some joy <laughs> and merriment. Oh, that my joy would be fulfilled in you, Jesus said. Hmm. Yes, Lord. Please do it. No, Sarah, your wife, verse 19, will bear you a son. And you'll call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. And with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael... I've heard you. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He'll, make, he'll beget 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. It was Ishmael who attacked Israel. The, the conflict is between Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael represents the Arab people. They became the Muslim people. And God has blessed them, has he not? I've been to Riyadh. That's a pretty big, cool city. Dubai. I mean, they're very blessed people. And there's a lot of them. And he loves them. Praise the Lord. Verse 21. But... My covenant I will establish with Isaac. As blessed as those people are who live in the Middle East, who are non-Jewish, there is a need for conversion, not to Judaism, but to the king of the Jews, so that they can receive not physical circumcision, but circumcision of the heart. And that's what Paul teaches us in the New Testament, amen? Amen. Right? Circumcision is not in the flesh. It's spiritually of the heart. Jeremiah would preach this. Ezekiel would preach this. Paul preaches it. It's what Jesus did. It's what Paul teaches us in Colossians chapter 2. I'll put the verse on the screen for you. In him also you were circumcised. It was a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You, who were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to his cross. My covenant is established with you, Abram. And then Jesus, the king, came on the scene. You know, it's a powerful scene in John chapter 6 where John records the feeding of the 5,000. And it tells us there in John 6, and he's the only one that says this, but by the way, the feeding of the 5,000 is recorded by all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? Not all the miracles are recorded, but that one is. All four of them. But John adds a little footnote. It says that after Jesus fed the 5,000, all the people came and they said, it's him. What we've just experienced, it's the prophet that we've been waiting for. And let's go make him the king. That's what it says. And Jesus said, uh-uh. Because if you make me the king without a heart change, it's not going to do any good. I need to go to the cross. He backed off. 
Can you imagine the humility? Like, holy cow, the people are like, we want you to be your king. I want to be your king. I am the king. Where is he that's born king of the Jews? He was a king before he was born. He was born a king. The king died. Are you a king, Pilate said. Yeah, I'm a king. What are you doing, man? I'm dying for you. Because you need a heart change. God can make something out of nothing. Abraham and Sarah were dead physically. Not spiritually. We're all dead spiritual. We're born with a sinful nature. He can make something out of nothing. And the king came and he gave his life. And all of our sin got transferred onto him. And he took full responsibility for it. And accepted God's justice and wrath that we deserve. The wrath of God abides on us. John 3, 36. And the only thing to get that future truth out of our life is to con- repent and confess our lives, surrender our lives to Jesus. Just like Mary, be it unto me. I surrender my life to you. And God can make a new creation. He can take a, an old man and make a new man. It's the facts. And that is the power of God to salvation. It's what it is. The Lord's not saying, and now the Lord's saying, you need to apply that to your own life. I'm making my covenant with, with anybody who would repent and believe the gospel. Because the king died and rose again. And where did he go when he died? Or when he rose? And when he ascended to heaven, where did he go? It told us in Psalm 110. We went through this extensively in Hebrews. It says he went back to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God Almighty. He sat down. The king assumed his place again. God, can you imagine? God Almighty became God powerless when he went to the cross. What a loving God we serve that he would come down and get low and be obedient to death and he died your death and he died my death. He stood in my place, your place as a great high priest. You repent, you'll laugh. You'll laugh with joy because the Holy Spirit will come into you and you will laugh. I can testify. I can testify. Living in darkness and guilt and shame did not know how to get out of it. And I knew one thing. I'm in trouble with God. The house of cards collapsed in my life by his grace. Suddenly, I knew I was caught. And suddenly, the Holy Spirit came upon me and I just laughed. Thank you, God. The, the, it was like Pilgrim in his progress, and Pilgrim's progress, Christian, the weight of the backpack that was so heavy carrying it around, I can't seem to keep doing the right things. And it just fell off. I was forgiven. And I knew that I was loved and accepted, and I knew there was hope, and I knew that my wife, who I'd betrayed, who had also just come to faith, I knew that he was going to rebuild us. We just knew. God Almighty, he can make something out of, he can fix broken things. The leper who was incurably ill, fourth stage four, basically, was Luke, how he presents him to us. If you're willing, you can make me clean. That leper, oh, he came, to, he came in faith. He said, I know you can. Are you willing? He didn't come and say, I know you're willing, but can you? Look, everybody was willing. Everybody felt bad for the guy. He'd been sick and outcast from society because of his terminal disease, leprosy. That man came in faith. 
He said, I know you can, but are you willing? And Jesus got down on his level and he touched the unclean and healed them in broad daylight. And what was true of that man physically is true of every human spiritually. He will forgive. He will heal your life. He'll put you in your right mind so that you'll see the world from God's eyes. You'll love people you didn't think you could love. A Jew and an Arab in the same church? Yes. Amen, yes. And it happens. Loving Jesus. Loving each other. Gonna blow their minds. Jesus prayed that in John 17. Oh Lord, when these apostles go out and preach the gospel, oh, that everybody that believes, and here's their words, that they might be one and you're gonna be glorified, and people are gonna go, What just happened? We got a black and a white and a brown and a green and a yellow and a whatever all in the same room. All worshiping Jesus. My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. It's kind of a birth announcement. <laughs> you better get the birthing room book there. <laughs> Looking at Chrissy. When are you due anyway? Christmas. All right. Very special. Verse 22, then he finished talking with him. And God went up from Abraham. Holy cow. So, Abraham took Ishmael his son and all who were born in his house and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day as God had said to them. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael and all the men of his house, born in the house or bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. That was a really good act of faith. Because I'll tell you what, if I'd been Abraham, I'm like, all right, I hear you, almighty one. But I'll tell you what, I'll circumcise myself when I see that she's pregnant. Because then I'll, then I'll see Right? I mean, it's not like she's going to miss her period anymore. Right? That ain't going to happen. But at some point in time, there's going to be a little bump. Right? And then they're going to put their ear down there. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. I think I'll get circumcised. No, he didn't do that. It says that very same day. Abraham had some pretty big fears and some pretty big failures. But that man also had some pretty big faith. And that very same day, he's like, I believe what you said, almighty God. And so I'm going to do this by faith. I'm going to apply the covenant to my own life. And I'm setting myself apart now unto you. And from this point on, you're going to be glorified. He has a good man. And by the way, not everybody that got circumcised was a believer. Ishmael was not a believer. It's true. He never was, as far as we know. He was faithful, everybody in his household. And from generations past, Isaac got circumcised on the eighth day, and he circumcised Esau and Jacob, and on down the line. So you can go through the physical act, but God sees the heart. He sees the heart. He saw Abram's heart. Remember, the circumcision was just a sign of the faith that he already had. God imputed righteousness to this man through the faith that he had. Well, I think I'll just close by just saying that kind of going back where I started because I just wanted to present my Jesus is God Almighty and the language of God Almighty 
And ten times, I will. He's declaring his devotion to his bride. That's how I see it. It's exactly what Paul teaches us about Jesus. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. I'll bet you those words that came from God over Abraham were just so refreshing, life-changing. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless. You know, we see it all fulfilled in Revelation. Amen? Revelation 21. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That really is the heart of the covenant. I want to be with you. Isn't that a song? I want to be with you. <laughs> Come on, Eric. You don't know. All right. Of all the songs in the whole world. That's God's heart. Almighty God loves people. He wants to be with us. He is with us. God with us. Isn't that what he told Joseph? Emmanuel. God with us. Call his name Yeshua, Savior. Our Emmanuel is our Savior. And when you repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ, you become a new creation. He makes something new out of your life. He doesn't promise us a rose garden. I don't want to send you on a wrong idea here. This is new to you. I think I appreciate the one song that we sang there. You know, if suffering comes, I just look to the cross. It's a hard world. We live in really troubling times. I'm not saying that to bum you out. I'm just saying God's the king. And he's coming again. He is. Time's going to run out. This isn't going to go on like this forever. That's good news. He's coming. And when he comes, he's taken over. And there'll be a time of judgment. Believe in the Lord with all your heart. You'll be saved. Christian, maybe it's just a moment of saying, you know, I've got, been doing some stuff that's been kind of fleshly, <laughs> carnal, sinful. I just kind of, kind of come back and just have that cut away, so to speak, just through confession. And just own it. Say it exactly what it is. Say it exactly what it is. And just say, Lord, forgive me. I look to you. I know that it was finished on the cross. I don't have to do something to make myself right with you. I just have to have a fresh application of your blood on my life to be forgiven. That you might restore me, Lord, to a life of, of laughter, of joy, in the midst of a hard world. A lot of reasons to be Depressed or disillusioned or yeah. That's all I'll say. Why don't we stand together and just take a moment and I ask you to just take a moment, friends, confess your sin nothing comes to mind, praise the Lord for that. Just ask for it to be filled again that God's kingdom would expand. So let's just do that quietly for about 30 seconds. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.
God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Sing it again. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Praise the Lord. It has been a joy to be with you this morning, to go through the Word together, to see you engaging with the Word. It's been such a joy. May God deeply bless you. All right? Amen. Go in peace.